Okay, so for the next uh, three talks of this morning's session, we'll move on to Core Collapse Supernova, and we'll start off by a review by uh, Thomas Janka, who will talk about 3D Core Collapse Supernova modeling and do a comparison to some observations. Yeah, I'm very grateful uh, for the invitation, and it's a pleasure for me to be here. I follow up on what uh, Dan introduced uh, very, very nicely from the perspective of an observer. Uh, I will come now to the theorist's uh, perspective, uh, which uh, yeah, we try to still merge. It's very hard because uh, these objects are messy, they are evolved, they need to uh, be simulated from the numerical uh, aspect uh, in three dimensions, uh, very time consuming, and we still work on solving this problem in its full beauty. Uh, so the reason why I came here is not this event, uh, which I was asked by email by a colleague. Uh, uh, is that the reason why you are in London, supernova uh, running exercise or running competition? <laughs> no, we actually are more... <laughs> I don't know why they name it supernova, actually. You can register here, pre-register, actually. Uh, so we are actually here for this uh, reason. We have uh, massive stars uh, called collapse cases uh, here, the... Iron core collapses to a neutron star within less than a second, forms a hot neutron star, which then cools by intense neutrino emission and leaves behind these objects, uh, Supernova 87A, Crab, Cassiopeia A. They all come from the later evolution of what looks after about one second like this. So there is the neutron star at the center, and when you simulate the explosion setting in by neutrino heating in three dimensions, you get ejecta, which are highly asymmetric and which, which, which start expanding with about 10,000 kilometers per second. And of course, the evolution here after this first second has to be continued over a long, long, long time in order to then see how it folds into this late structure. We are doing this in steps now. Oh, sorry. We have started uh, with that uh, recently connecting self-consistent three-dimensional explosions. Uh, actually, some of these recent models started out with three-dimensional morphologies in the progenitors already. And then we continue into the late stages in order to answer questions like these. What are the messages which supernovae and supernova remnants uh, can tell us about the explosion mechanism and the progenitor properties? How are these properties of the supernovae and the gaseous remnants connected to those of the compact objects in the centers? And uh, we have diagnostic access uh, to this uh, by uh, different uh, possibilities which we explored recently, the light curve uh, structures, the nebula spectra, the neutron star kicks, and the observational aspects which we uh, can, uh, uh, can uh, look into in this respect. The distribution of radioactive nuclei, iron group in particular, and titanium, which can be observed still at later stages, morphology, of the remnants and radioactive gamma uh, ray line profiles. So the, re, the, the main targets at the moment of these studies in the theoretical uh, models is these three supernova remnants for the reason uh, I mentioned here. They are young, they are close, they are therefore very well observed and resolved, and the progenitors are of very interesting types uh, and as uh, an, an experimentalist, I also have to constrain the model somehow, so we have to look at the right progenitors. Uh, we cannot simulate hundreds of models in 3D, and we have to also get the models exploding with the right energies. Uh, so these energies uh, are somehow constrained for these cases. Otherwise, we would be lost in the three-dimensional modeling aspect. What is the mechanism which we are uh, pretty sure uh, at the moment, uh, or uh, now, after a lot of work over decades, uh, well, we think that this intense radiation, the neutron star emits by neutrinos, that this radiation is causal for the explosion. There is some non-vanishing interactions of the radiated neutrinos in the immediate environment of the neutron star. Here you see these neutrino-heated material, these bubbles of neutrino-heated material expanding. That's from a three-dimensional simulation that's merged with a cartoon. And these bubbles push the shock, the shock is expanding and accelerating outwards, creates radioactive elements like 56 nickel, 58 nickel. They are produced just behind this outgoing shock. 
Uh, this is uh, in, inserted here in a cartoonish fashion. Of course, the, all these pockets would be filled with nickel. Also, the bubbles contain significant amount of nickel. And uh, the explosion somehow is also triggered and may get asymmetries from perturbations pre-existing before the core collapse in the oxygen shell of the progenitor. Here, also from a three-dimensional simulation, which we did for one of the models, where we started five minutes before the core collapse, modeling the convective oxygen burning in three dimensions. We do that for another progenitor now in order to maybe answer the uh, Cas A jet issue. I may mention this later again. I don't show you results. It's not yet available. So what we do is modeling the explosions, but then we have to work through the whole star. We start at the very center, a few hundred kilometers away from the Newton star. That's where the early instabilities happen. The initial asymmetries come from the mechanism. Uh, but there is further perturbations not quite well shown in this kind of cartoon. It shows the scales. Uh, it's a difficult problem. You see that multiplying the scales by a factor of 10, a factor of 4, 20, 50, then we are on the scale of the whole star, and this is for a blue supergiant, 10 times larger for a red supergiant. Uh, there is also hydrodynamical instabilities at the interfaces of the carbon-oxygen and the helium layers and between the carbon-oxygen layer shell and the hydrogen envelope. There are secondary instabilities, so-called Rayleigh-Taylor instabilities, which grow after the shock has moved through. And these perturb and change the initial structures of the explosion. So we have to take all this into account. Uh, don't have a way to show a movie here. It's also hard to visualize. So I just mentioned this issue. I show you plots later where you can see a comparison of late and early stages. So let me now work through these observables which I mentioned briefly. Um, and I will show you, flash you a couple of results. So the neutron star is very interesting to us because the neutron star is, of course, carrying consequences of these explosion asymmetries. And in order to understand the high velocities, uh, some of these neutron stars, young neutron stars in particular, have, uh, we have to really connect uh, this uh, with the explosion. We do that with large sets of models. We assume that this neutrino-driven mechanism works. We do that self-consistently in some models, but not in these large sets of three-dimensional models. We have currently already 50 three-dimensional explosions, but we start those in a parameterized way, which follows this neutrino-driven mechanism by some uh, simplification so that we can run many models and are not just stuck with very few of them self-consistently run through this neutrino uh, heating phase. Yeah, what you see usually uh, is these asymmetries I showed already. Here's a cross-section. Uh, this is a color coding of the density in some plane. And the neutron star kick is indicated here as the white arrow. And uh, this is the neutron star spin. So spin and kick directions are not linked. And you see that the kick, this white direction, is towards the high-density material, which is moving more slowly. So the explosion is faster, is more, uh, is more powerful in the opposite direction uh, to the neutron star motion. The neutron star is kicked just by momentum conservation. You can easily understand this. The neutron star is kicked in the direction opposite to which the explosion has more strength. And uh, this is, uh, well, the acceleration happens by what we term gravitational tugboat mechanism. It's actually taking place on a very long time scale with respect to comparing it to the early phases of the explosion. So several seconds, the neutron star is pulled by the gravitational interaction with this high-density material opposite to the direction of strong explosion. And here we have a sample of uh, our five models. We have many more, as I said, about 40 or so, where the neutron star velocities now range up to even more than 1,000 kilometers per second, and the neutron star kick velocity is mostly linked to the explosion energy and of, to a parameter which I termed alpha ejector here. It's an asymmetry parameter of this inner ejector. It can vary. It's a stochastically variable quantity, which we haven't determined uh, with its respect to progenitor dependencies very well. Yet we need many more models to see whether there is some systematics where this asymmetry of the explosion is linked to the progenitor. But the main parameter entering here is the explosion energy. The higher the explosion energy, the more likely it is to get a high neutron star kick. When you compare now high velocity kicks with low velocity kicks uh, with the respect to the asymmetry of the innermost ejector, and here taken to be the distribution of iron group elements, you see a very interesting result. 
you see that most of the iron group material in titanium, which is formed close to where iron is formed, follows a similar pattern. Most of this titanium or iron is kicked or is ejected opposite in the opposite hemisphere to a high velocity kick. Here, neutron star with a velocity of 550 kilometers per second. Here, 600 kilometers or more than 600 kilometers per second. You see how asymmetrically the distribution of this iron group material is. It's more symmetric in con contrast for low velocity kicks. Here, the neutron star only has 250 kilometers per second. Here, 150 kilometers per second. 100 kilometers per second. It's more symmetrically. There is no, no such. Uh, dramatic hemispheric difference in the uh, distribution of these iron group material. We have tried to connect these two observations actually in a close collaboration with observers, a group led by Satoru Katsuda. Uh, here we have six interesting remnants where either the kick velocity, as in Cassiopeia A of the neutron star, is well observed and measured, or it could be deduced from the uh, asymmetries in the intermediate mass elements, and the Japanese did a very, really excellent job on that, and their result here published came out more or less parallel uh, to another paper by uh, Laura Lopez and collaborators, uh, which came uh, to the same conclusion. So the main conclusion from this work, and I don't have time to go into the details, is that in all these cases, the new here now aligned with the neutron star velocity, the neutron star velocity is opposite to the main uh, velocity uh, obtained by the intermediate mass elements. So the center of mass of, the immediate, of these intermediate mass elements from about neon to iron, where also some imprints of these early asymmetries are still carried in, all these intermediate mass elements, uh, the center of mass of them moves in the opposite direction to the neutron star kick. And even uh, close analysis shows that we see some of this correlation between this asymmetry parameter, which we can measure and the neutron star speed. So that seems to be consistent with what we did before and we actually published some years before uh, with respect uh, on, 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 the, on grounds of our three-dimensional modeling and understanding of the mechanism. Let us now come to Cassiopeia A, which was already discussed in quite some detail by Dan. I flashed some of the things uh, which we did because he showed them very, very briefly only. So this was a very fantastic result by the Gravenstätte uh, group in Nature 2014, where they showed the iron, uh, the titanium distribution directly measured, and uh, they actually compared this to the kick uh, direction of the neutron star. So this is uh, the, the high, uh, highly enriched titanium clumps, and you can see here the neutron star kick is in the opposite hemisphere. That's exactly compatible say a similar image from the same paper, exactly compatible with what our models show where, uh, in cases where the kick is high. Here is one of the models which we simulated, two dozens of simulations at that time when we published the paper uh, for this uh, model. Uh, we had one case which looked morphologically very similar to the Cas A remnant. Here is the simulation, neutron star kick and iron distribution and titanium distributions. When we assume that the reverse shock has moved uh, halfway into the remnant and has heated the iron. Iron will be visible only outside of the reverse shock in this shock heated shell, while titanium can be seen all over the remnant. So that is what we would compare directly to what Cassiopeia A observations show. I show you some other images. Dan has shown similar ones uh, where you see this iron concentrated in this uh, reverse shock heated shell in three purple regions here, three fingers or plumes and we compare this to the same model. I showed you here another image. I think that is even from Dan, if I'm not mistaken. And here we see these three plumes where you have iron-rich uh, material, but iron is expected to be also inside of this position of this circle where I re mark the reverse shock location. And this is the neutron star kick. And Dan, you raised the question, yeah, the neutron star kick seems to know somehow why, why it should move in the direction where there is no high velocity material. Uh, actually, the answer from the perspective of a theorist is, yeah, of course, I mean, high velocity material uh, takes away the momentum in this direction while the neutron star carries the momentum in the other direction. So the fact that the neutron star in Cas A is not seen to move in the direction of the high velocity material is exactly compatible with what you would expect on grounds of theory. Now, this is also from Gravenstätte, but from a paper two years later, 2016, actually 17. And you can see 
that here the silicon 2 material, here these knots indicate the titanium locations they had uh, two years or three years later, they had a three-dimensional analysis of the titanium, including the radial uh, velocity, of, uh, which they analyzed subsequently uh, to the Nature paper. And here you can see that the silicon, and including uh, also some regions with titanium, are forming a thick, what is called a thick disk. Uh, they call it a thick disk, and we also see this in our simulations, the same model again. This is the front view I showed you before, and now we look at it from the left side, so the left view, and you see that these ejecta more or less uh, are condensed uh, to a thick disk-like uh, structure. Here is, uh, I think, iron, uh, which we showed, and here it's titanium, and here you can see the neutron star kick is uh, here shown as a vector. The observer would look uh, at the remnant from the right-hand side, so uh, in the y direction, so the neutron star is kicked towards us. I have shown this here as an arrow as well, and this comes from the analysis of Gravenstedt as well. Titanium, most of the titanium is in the opposite hemisphere, takes away momentum to the opposite side. The neutron star is kicked in this direction, and they determine a radial velocity of minus 250 kilometers per second, and the uh, tangential velocity is of the order of 320 to 360 kilometers per second. That would mean there is an angle between the line uh, of sight and the direction of the neutron star motion of about 60 degrees, which I showed here by the arrow. We actually come to the same conclusion uh, in a new analysis. It's a paper in preparation, work done by Anders Jörgstrand in my group at the moment, where Anders is doing three-dimensional uh, transport of gamma rays in our three-dimensional explosions. And here you see some uh, data comparison of the uh, Gravenstedt data with his line profiles. And you see they match pretty well for two cases here. The two lines here uh, are just a test. Don't, carry about, uh, don't worry about the differences here. So you see here two observer directions. And uh, these are optimal directions which we chose. Here you see the directional uh, dependence of uh, the uh, um, uh, least mean uh, square, uh, uh, not of the least mean, of the chi uh, parameter. So the optimal direction would be about here, but this direction is similarly good. And here are the line profiles observed from these directions. And they are off from the Newton star kick direction by about 30 to 70 degrees. So that is com fully consistent with what Gravenstedt published. Now let's come to supernova 87A. Uh, here, that's what I promised to you, the morphology at early stages, some second or two seconds after the onset of the explosion for four different cases. Here, blue supergiant B15, that's the old, very first model which Stan Woosley published um, in uh, a year after supernova 87A. And here is a, a Nomoto model, which we exploded also by the neutrino-driven mechanism and here's another more recent uh, 87A progenitor from Stan Woosley exploded four seconds after the onset, or 4.7 seconds after the onset of the explosion, and yet a newer model, which Stan published another 10 years later. So every 10 years he published a supernova 87A model. We got a bunch of recent models, also more recent ones a year ago or two years ago, which we have now posted with Victor Drobin in light curve studies on the server. And here you see the morphology of these explosions after about a day of expansion and mixing in the explosion. You see that this differs from case to case. So it is very progenitor dependent how the early instabilities look later and how these interfaces between the carbon oxygen core and helium shell and helium layer and hydrogen envelope, how these interfaces uh, break up by instabilities and um, yeah, modify the early instabilities at a later stage. And we studied these uh, mixing effects with respect to how does it shape, does, do they shape the light curve? Here you see this set of models uh, analyzed in uh, the light curve studies Victor Drobin has done, and this is part, uh, it's actually not in preparation, it's on the archive already, we posted it end of last year. And you can see that the best fit you reach is with this oldest model B15, but B15 is down there in the uh, luminosity temperature diagram, so it doesn't actually match the progenitor, um, yeah, the progenitor of 87A very well. Uh, but the light curve study, because of this intense mixing going on during the explosion, that's the result of B15. There is long extended fingers mixing out nickel. 
allow the light curve to rise quickly and to follow the observational data points pretty well. We don't match this minimum because the progenitor is just too extended. It has too large a radius. The model B15 wasn't pretty, uh, wasn't fine-tuned for matching uh, these observational constraints of 87A. All the other more recent models, including also Nomotos, which I didn't show here, we had it in the previous paper, Nomotos N20 model is on here, but they don't mix well uh, in the early stage. They don't have high velocity nickel. You see nickel is at much, much lower velocities in all of these other cases. Don't bring nickel enough into the, uh, deep enough into the hydrogen layer, and therefore the rise to the maximum of the light curve is not matched uh, uh, with respect to the comparison to the data. This is very promising. We have recent models from Menon and Alex Heger, which are based on a binary scenario for supernova 87A, a scenario which was already suggested many years ago, right after 87A, actually by Phil Podziadlowski. Uh, and uh, Menon and Heger have now evolved a binary, um, uh, binary systems uh, to the pre-core uh, collapse phase, and their progenitors match this observational luminosity, temperature, location of the progenitor of 87A pretty well. And actually, running them through our three-dimensional explosion machinery, we seem to match uh, the light curves uh, of 87A much, the data points much better. We also, for some of the progenitor models, get the minimum because the stars are much more compact, the radii are smaller of these progenitors which have lost mass in a binary interaction. 87A, uh, also from the perspective of three-dimensional morphology, this is a result by Larson where you see the ring plane, the observer direction, and here the iron uh, enriched region at the center. Don't care about this in a, in a central gap here. This is just an observational artifact. There is reflected light from the ring, and they had to take out the low velocity material at the center. It's an, it's an observational artifact, but we try to reproduce it by just choosing the same criterion which the observers uh, took for uh, cr uh, cutting this inner part out. So we did it for one of our models, and we get a very similar morphology. I think uh, there's two clumpy regions. Yeah, there's one clump here, but that is, a, of course, dependent very much on from model to model. So this is missing down there. So there's a huge region here. There's another region, uh, re uh, region here. Uh, where iron is enriched, the ring plane also here, and the observer direction. And we would conclude from this morphology that the Newton star in 87A should be kicked towards us. And that is actually also, uh, I come back to that uh, scene in the uh, analysis of the gamma ray lines, I come back to that in a few minutes, uh, two minutes or so. Uh, here we have a result uh, where also the morphology of the inner ejecta is evaluated, uh, looking at the carbon oxide and silicon oxide molecules, uh, Abeland uh, paper, so I, I, I used the plots there and put them in the same orientation. Here is the ring plane, observer direction, so that morphology of these uh, molecular regions can be compared to the, plot, to the previous plot. And we also looked at our models, so this is the observations, and here is the set, a subset of our models, W15, L15, N20, B15, and you see well, this is very hard to actually compare in detail. When we overlay silicon and oxygen, carbon and oxygen, and look at the regions where the abundances, the product of the abundances is optimal or is maximal, we, we can compare clumpy regions in the ejector of our models, our 3D models, with the observations, and they match pretty well for some of the cases here. This model nicely reproduces the asymmetries and the large-scale structures we see in the observations. Uh, there is a, a hole, which is also observed here. Well, the hole is missing, however, in the silicon oxide. It's here in the observations, but not here. Other models, like these ones, show the hole. So there is no perfect match, also because we didn't fine-tune. And on the other hand, as I told you, there is also some uh, problem or some uh, um, uh, uncertain uh, aspects to the progenitor structure. We will do that, and we hopefully have the manpower to do it, also maybe with the binary models in the near future. This is what I promised the gamma ray line profiles uh, for 87A. You know this uh, result uh, from uh, Gravenstetter's group uh, in a box, box et al. Uh, science paper the, where they analyzed the titanium lines and found them to be redshifted, indicating that the neutron star is kicked in 87A is kicked towards us. And we actually now do the line analysis uh, based on the cobalt decay lines because the titanium lines are not really resolved. 
So we see actually that a low kick case is not compatible with what is observed here in 87A with a, a model with 100 km per second neutron star kick. Uh, such a model is not able to reproduce the uh, cobalt decay line, but a model with 500 km per second is doing pretty well. And therefore we would conclude that the line, the story told by the co cobalt lines is very similar to that. We need a high velocity kick in the direction towards us. I don't have time to discuss this plot. I will flash only one more result on CRAB, just to mention CRAB, and a very interesting uh, remnant, which has been connected by quite a number of people in publication. That's not the only one. Uh, ones uh, to an oxygen near magnesium core explosion, so a uh, low mass star, which doesn't evolve uh, to, an iron, with an, uh, to an iron core before collapsing, but it retains an oxygen near magnesium core and forms a so-called electron capture supernova. Because of, well, the low explosion energy diagnosed for CRAB, and also because of a very, very little amount of uh, radioactive nickel which has been produced in the explosion. Uh, very little oxygen in this explosion um, in the remnant, and therefore this link was, um, was, uh, yeah, was expressed by some, uh, by some uh, groups. But there is a big problem. We simulated three-dimensional explosions of oxygen near magnesium core models. Here you see one example of this three-dimensional explosion which Alexandra Gessner in my group simulated. And with a bunch of models in 2D and 3D, we found or we evaluated for the neutron star kick distribution. And we got the maximum kicks of the order of a couple of uh, kilometers per second in these oxygen near magnesium core explosions. The reason for the low kick is, of course, that the oxygen near magnesium core is surrounded by low density material and there is no way to kick the neutron star to high velocities. So, this is in clear conflict with the fact that the Crab Pulsar is observed to have a proper motion of about 160 kilometers per second, uh, absolutely incompatible with the origin of this neutron star from an oxygen near magnesium core collapse or a so-called electron capture supernova. So what kicks the neutron star? Yeah, maybe it's not a hydrodynamical mechanism, but anisotropic neutrino emission. That's a completely different scenario, not excluded, but requires in, yeah, uh, exotic neutrino physics to get up to 160 kilometers per second. Or the other possibility maybe is a binary breakup uh, of a system where the explosion was connected uh, to uh, one of the components and the velocity which we see for the neutron star is the breakup velocity of the binary system. I skip these two slides and just flash my summary. Thank you for your patience. And thanks again to the organizers uh, for the possibility to, to present my results here. Thank you, Thomas, for a very nice talk. Do we have questions for Thomas? Um, just a clarification. Um, I understand uh, mixing could affect the asymmetric structure of the uh, nickels, but how does it affect the light curve? It was not quite clear to me. So. Uh, yeah. yeah, of course, I did not have time to, uh, uh, to explain the physics in detail. Well, the, the, the point is, is the following. There is two effects. Um, uh, the mixing uh, in the explosion also um, enhanced by the secondary instabilities at the shell interfaces allows nickel to be brought into the hydrogen shell with high velocity and the nickel is heating the hydrogen shell and therefore helps uh, the early to, to rise the early emission. On the other hand, also hydrogen is mixed inward, and inward mixing of hydrogen needs to be, uh, um, yeah, needs to be efficient in supernova 87A in order to get the length of the maximum, the duration of the maximum. Whenever you see uh, inefficient mixing, just try to go back here, in models uh, which don't mix very well, let me see that I can, yeah, uh, where the mixing uh, of hydrogen inward is deficient, you see that you don't, uh, you're not able to, uh, to match the late, uh, the late phase of this peak uh, down towards the tail of the supernova, yeah, to, to the light curve tail. So hydrogen, inward hydrogen mixing raises the luminosity here, outward mixing of nickel here, and if the mixing is inefficient, then you don't match the structure of the maximum. I apologize in advance in case my suggestion isn't relevant. 
Unfortunately, we cannot retrospectively uninvent fission and thermonuclear weapons, but quite a lot of information about their structure and function and very ultra-high speed photography of early stages of the detonations is in the public domain. So I just wonder if that information, when it's quite detailed, may be of help to people doing modeling in the way that you do. I, this came into mind looking at your early stage morphologies. Uh, your observation and your, um, your, your, your perception of the results I showed are very close to, uh, to reality, namely the instabilities we see in the early phase of the explosion are Rayleigh-Taylor instability. And this is also what you see when you do these experiments. In the Earth atmosphere, you see a mushroom rising, and that is exactly the same physics phenomenon. It's a Rayleigh-Taylor unstable situation where you release a lot of energy in a localized region, and then you get buoyancy instability uh, developing. Yeah, you're right. Of course, we have a lot of history in our field going back to Acti activity in the uh, bomb development and experimental sector. The first people doing these simulations actually were linked to the developments on the uh, atomic weapons in the 1950s. Uh, Sterling Colgate published a paper. Also, the fact that neutrinos may trigger the explosion came to Sterling Colgate's mind because he was involved in the hydrogen bomb uh, uh, developments where he knew that radiation pressure can be very important in exploding uh, yeah, these devices, and he came up with the idea of neutrinos for the supernova. Yeah. Thank you for the comment. We have time for one short question, if there is any. Anybody, another question? If not, let's thank Thomas again. Thank you.